Hi, everyone. I'm Max Desiadov. Uh I'm a software engineer uh, on the Swift team at Apple. Today, we'll talk about the Swift programming language and why it is interesting in the context of WebAssembly. I'll demo a Swift package written and built for WebAssembly interoperating with a C++ library. We'll see this package running in the browser environment, but it's easily deployed. Uh, it can be easily adapted to support more platforms and environments as needed. I'll wrap up with some pointers for where to go from here, and I'm happy to answer questions after that. So Swift is open source, modern, and general purpose programming language. You can run Swift toolchain on all mainstream platforms, including Mac OS, Linux, and Windows, and cross-compile to even more platforms, uh, embedded, uh, and of course, WebAssembly. I've been working for years on WASM support, uh, within the Swift WASM community. I'm incredibly excited to announce uh, that all of the changes necessary to cross-compile to WASM are now available in the upstream Swift repository. Swift has an active open source community at swift.org, and uh, all of the source code for toolchain, core libraries, and uh, the package manager are hosted on GitHub, uh, where everyone can contribute to Swift. You can build apps, servers, uh, use Swift for system programming, and uh, even deploy uh, to microcontrollers. Why would you consider Swift uh, when targeting WebAssembly? It has high performance uh, thanks to the full suite of LVM optimizations, uh, so your code will run fast. Swift uses automatic reference counting, uh, so there is no garbage collector overhead, giving you unexpected pauses uh, during the execution. And Swift has a static type system, uh, so you can catch more errors in compile time, and uh, you can write portable code as well. It also has a gradual learning curve, and it is e easy to pick up if you're coming from a different programming language. Advanced features such as uh, the memory ownership model is there. Uh, the, these advanced features are there when you need them, but they don't, don't get in your way when you're trying to, to, to write code. To paraphrase it, a famous quote was Swift's simple things are easy and uh, complicated and hard things are possible. As a quick, as a quick introduction to Swift, uh, I'll demonstrate WebAssembly support and generate music programmatically. What's cool is that since Swift has high performance and low memory consumption, we can even reuse this example code in real-time audio. We'll develop this as a Swift package in Visual Studio Code right here on stage. At the, at the bottom of the slide, you can see a waveform graph of sounds uh, this code is going to produce. So with that quick introduction out of the way, uh, let's jump in, into our demo project. Uh, open VS Code here. So the first uh, line of Swift we're going to write here is a uh, sample rate. We'll declare it as a, we'll declare the magical number of 44.1 kilohertz, which is the amount of samples we, are, uh, we have to generate per second. Uh, what is a sample, actually? Sound is a waveform that represents the vibration of the medium that this sound is going through, a speaker or, or air. And, sit, and based on this, we can say a sample is the amplitude of the waveform at a given moment. And to represent the waveform uh, with pretty good accuracy, 44,000 uh, samples per second is good enough. But that's still a lot of, uh, a lot of sample generations that we have, and that puts enough constraints on uh, performance and memory consumption. The simplest waveform we can define here is a sawtooth-shaped uh, waveform. We define it as a function that takes uh, current time in seconds that has passed since previous oscillations, the frequency, uh, both of floating point type. Based on these, we calculate the phase of the waveform and apply a well-known formula to return the results, uh, also of the floating point type. Now, to generate, to keep generating samples continuously, uh, we need to keep track of current state and also update it as we go. Best tool for that in Swift is a struct declaration. So you can see here uh, we declare struct called saw with a couple of properties for tracking frequency, amplitude, current time, again in seconds. We use the var keyword to indicate that this state can be mutable. And in the function declaration for generating the next sample below, uh, which is also mutating, again, more explicitness with regards to what is mutable or not, um, 
in, in the body of the function, we delegate to the existing sub function we declared above, return the result. Uh, we also update current time as necessary, making sure there are no overflows here happening. As I said, we keep generating uh, samples indefinitely, so overflows can lead to some uh, weird artifacts in your sound. It's not a catastrophic failure, but you need to make sure there are no overflows happening, so we are only tracking time since previous oscillations and reset this time. An assignment on self means that we are uh, updating properties here, specifically current time here. And we return the result uh, multiplied by the current amplitude. We want our code to work with uh, different waveforms, not just the sawtooth waveform. So we use, we want to make this code generic and in Swift to use protocols for that. It declares an interface that a specific type has to conform to. So here it's a mutating function next that generates an example of the floating point type, uh, which is exactly the declaration that we saw for the uh, sawtooth struct. So we can go back and add a conformance on uh, saw to signal. Great. Uh, where are we even going with, with this? Th this seems quite simplistic, but uh, we can build with these simple primitives uh, to something more advanced. I will show you uh, the data flow of samples that we'll be working with. So I've shown you the signal protocol. We can manipulate any signal, uh, asking it for the next sample. We'll iterate over the samples, populate the audio buffer. So we need enough samples to produce some sound. We'll either give it to the encoder, which will write a waveform file that we can actually listen to, or plot it, because visual, visualizing these waveforms is also helpful. And for this, uh, the plotter will use a Canvas implementation specifically in the browser uh, through JavaScript interop. With this, um, I've shown you the signal type and we can create an audio buffer to accumulate these samples. Again, a struct declaration with a storage, initializer, deinitializer. Uh, in the initializer, we take a fixed capacity, we take a source signal, uh, allocate the buffer for this capacity, and iterate through indices in this buffer, asking on each, itera each iteration for a sample, which we write in corresponding element via the index on this buffer. Um, Great, uh, we want to represent this visually at first. Uh, so we need a canvas to draw something. There's a protocol canvas in the multi-platform approach we are taking, taking for this package. Uh, we're we declaring a protocol here with only four functions for drawing uh, samples on the screen. Uh, in the, this could be in, the, in an abstract component model uh, kind of framework. You could say this is an interface declared by a component. Uh, but for the simple types that we are passing around, like just integers, this is enough. We, can, uh, we don't need the component model overhead for the, in this simple case. We declare HTML canvas implementation. Uh, for each function, we uh, add an external WASM attribute, which says that this function, the underlying implementation of this function, comes in externally, uh, in our case from JavaScript, uh, it comes externally from a module linked, uh, imported into the current WASM module under the name Canvas, and the name of the imported function. Here it matches exactly the function uh, declared on the Swift side. Let's see how it looks on the JavaScript side. So there's the imports object uh, declared, and here's that Canvas module, which basically proxies to the Canvas context uh, declared here um, in, the, in the same file. And uh, whatever arguments are passed, we pass them verbatim to the corresponding methods. And below, we just instantiate the WebAssembly module produced by the Swift compiler uh, and pass this imports object uh, to link the functions uh, from, uh, for JS interop to work. Uh, great. Uh, we got the canvas working. We actually want to draw something. Uh, with that canvas, so for that we declare a plotter struct, a couple of uh, constant properties that we initialize for layout purposes uh, in the initializer, and the plot function on it uh, takes an audio buffer as an argument. We won't be drawing every single sample, so as I said, there are like tens of thousands, millions of samples for long, uh, uh, for long audio files. 
so we calculate the number of samples we will draw for every pixel of the graph, but then iterate over the buffer and calculate an average over this window of samples for a specific uh, point on the graph. Uh, and with that average, we just draw the line on the graph with the canvas implementation I've shown you before. So now we have uh, enough building blocks to proceed to define the main entry point function. At expose attribute is the counterpart of the at extern attribute. Uh, it does the opposite thing, is expose a Swift function to JavaScript under a given name. Uh, you have to be explicit with the, with the name here, since uh, uh, with more advanced languages like C, C++ and Swift, there is name mangling uh, that can get in the way. So we have to encode, compilers encode a lot of information under the hood, but uh, uh, this is more of a low level detail. So here, we just def define the export name explicitly. In the body of the function, we uh, create this sort of waveform with a given frequency of two hertz. Uh, We'll generate six seconds of audio, which is enough. Create an audio buffer with a given sample rate. Sample rate multiplied by the number of seconds is the total number of samples we have to generate. We give it the source for that, the sort of uh, waveform. We encode that in a waveform uh, audio file. Use a plotter with HTML canvas, certain layout constants passed, and then uh, pass the buffer to the plot function. Uh, let's check the status of our build. Everything successful. Um, so that's great. No errors in this demo. And something actually generated here. I'll switch back to the editor uh, for a second to show you that we can actually update this uh, in the real time for, let's say, let's set the frequency to one second, sorry, one hertz. 4 hertz, uh, 0 0.5 hertz. These, uh, these frequencies are inaudible, so uh, I'm only using these low frequencies for us to see that there is actually a sawtooth shape here. Uh, but the range of human hearing is, uh, for most people, 20, to tw uh, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So maybe we can start with something like 30 hertz. Uh, and uh, let's set amplitude to something um, like uh, order of magnitude less, uh, so that you don't get startled by this noise. Uh, well, I, I'll be upfront that this is not entirely musical for now. Let's see, do I need to make this louder? Uh, excuse me. Uh, doesn't seem like there's audio output. Um, I'll play it again. It's not musical by any measure, so let's be upfront. It's just a fixed, harsh tone. So I'm playing it at low volume at uh, f only for a couple of seconds. But we need more interesting waveforms to produce something musical. And in limited amount of time that I have, as I promised, like, we will generate music here. Um, so how do, we, how do we get more complex waveforms in the limited amount of time we have? Like in the real world project, we, have, uh, we don't have a luxury of writing everything from scratch. And a lot of the time you can use in open source libraries and specifically in uh, software audio ecosystem, uh, a lot of libraries, vast majority of libraries are written in C and C++ due to these uh, real time audio constraints. So this is, uh, fortunately, for Swift, which is built on top of LVM and it's C and C++ compiler Clang, we can interoperate with these libraries easily. Uh, specifically, in our case, I will use uh, a language called Volt, which can transpile to C++. Uh, it's a specialized language for digital signal processing. And uh, you can see here a declaration for the triangle waveform. Uh, this function process declared in Volt when transpiled to C++ uh, is called triangle underscore process, which takes triangle context type, also declared in C++ by mutable reference. Uh, and one last thing to note here in this out.cpp file, it's declared in valdsp, it is created in valdsp directory. I'll show you in a few seconds why that matters. So how can we call this from Swift? Uh, let's uh, switch back to uh, Swift source code and declare the triangle struct. 
So whatever, conventionally with Swift Package Manager, everything that's in a uh, subdirectory with a given name under sources, it belongs to a module with that same name. So whatever public headers were on the C++ module called valdsp, it becomes available with import valdsp uh, in this file on the first line. As for the triangle declaration itself, we set the pitch, the amplitude, a couple more, a couple of properties that are quite obvious, but the most interesting one here is state uh, of triangle context type, uh, which is declared in C++. So it is important to emphasize here that for calling into C++, there is no overhead. You, you, you might think that we need to create this into a component and uh, wrap C++ code into another component and link these components and then sort out the ABI issues. Swift compiler knows about C++ and C's calling convention, and it can generate direct calls into C++ thanks to that. Um, it can create a value of that type directly. These declarations are available uh, for us here thanks to Swift compiler integrating with uh, Clang's uh, parser for C++. And in the next function for this triangle waveform, we again call a C++ function triangle underscore process, pass state, um, by mutable reference as needed, and a couple of uh, properties, uh, excuse me, a couple of values that are also floating point parameters that triangle process function requires that. And we, as, in, as you've seen for the sawtooth wave, uh, waveform, we also multiply the result by amplitude to scale for uh, desired volume. Now, with this triangle waveform, there, there's one missing thing here. I haven't told you what pitch is. Uh, so let's declare that pitch. Uh, uh, it's a struct. I'm declaring a few more magic numbers here. These are not hertz. Uh, so if you're interested in, in, uh, in audio and musical theory, uh, you may know that hertz uh, raise exponentially with every octave. Here we declare like a linear, uh, I wouldn't say scale, a, a, a linear, uh, linear, declar linear increments uh, of pitch uh, for every note. So for every note, we have a certain value that VolDSP, for example, understands. And we have a helper function octave that allows us to scale pitch by integer values. Uh, we can shift the pitch. Uh, lower and or higher with assigned integer passed here and create a new pitch based on that. Uh, great, we have a lot of, basically almost all of the building blocks here. Uh, there's one more uh, fundamental one needed, modulator, which can combine multiple signals. Uh, modulation in uh, signal processing means changing parameters of one signal with time. And here we're using a different signal to do that. Uh, it's actually sequencing is one other thing that uh, I need to mention. So circling back to triangle, modulating pitch will give us melodies and modulating amplitude will give us rhythm. Thus, uh, sequences of these modulations uh, will give us what we need, the actual music that we can generate. So here's a sequencer helper type that is also a signal, and it takes a signal as a generic argument. There is the sequencer step, which is either not on or off. When it is on, it requires a given pitch. Um, great. Uh, then we can define our instruments here. Here's the bass instrument. Uh, it's a modulator of a triangle waveform. Uh, returns next sample, basically wraps the triangle waveform, wraps the modulator, and just res returns samples from those uh, and uh, gives samples back bas based on the sequen current sequencer step value. Um, excuse me. And then we can also define the drums, uh, the kick, and the hi-hat. Uh, we need a noise waveform, which we again take from VolDSP, since VolDSP is great that it provides all of these instruments for us that are uh, readily available. Uh, noise process function for that noise waveform, we use it in the hi-hat. Basically, modulated noise gives us very uh, characteristic ch sound uh, of the hi-hat. The kick is readily available, same, uh, same processing of the sequencer, current step property of, for a given sequencer step, and we process the kick based on a given note. Um, 
then we need to mix these uh, instruments together. So let's declare a mixer. Uh, again, a generic type that takes multiple signals and basically sums their samples. Um, I can also show you, for this to be more visible, we, we have three instruments, back, a bass, kick, and hi-hat. Uh, bass is based on the triangle waveform, hi-hat on the noise waveform, kick becomes readily available, completely implemented on the Val DSP side. And we sequence them together and put them into the mixer. Uh, finally, I think we're ready to produce something uh, quite musical. Um, I declare our hard code some sequences for the kick, for the hi-hat, uh, for bass as well. The mixer mixes them together at given volumes. Um, and then we fill the buffer um, with a given mixer. With this mixer, we encode this buffer and use the same invocation for the plot uh, for the plotter. Uh, of course, there is an error that I need to fix. Uh, I only need to delete these lines. This is what happens when you edit your sample code just before the demo. Um, did that fix it? Uh, of course, the coma is missing uh, here. Great. Uh, we can see this is more complicated sound. Uh, there are spikes, which correspond probably to either specifically to the kick or to the hi-hat. Uh, both, uh, it's definitely visually it feels more complicated than what we've heard before. Uh, and I'll, let's, let's hear that. I'll try to play it. Six seconds of audio, finally, we produced that. Um, one other thing to note here is that um, the binary size of the produced WASM module is about 100 kilobytes, which is pretty good for the amount of code that we have. Uh, this actually includes an, an allocator, uh, which we had to bring for uh, the audio buffer. But if you're constrained with binary size, you can actually, and you know this is, this is the only buffer you will use. You can throw, provide some kind of shame allocator, allocator that will just say, this buffer is here always, forever. And when we shut down, we don't need to deallocate. Um, basically, you have full control over um, memory if you need that. And if you don't, you can use high-level structures uh, by default with reference counting. Uh, to, Summarize uh, and, and to wrap up specifically for this demo, we've uh, got a feel of what Swift looks like. Uh, we've tried JavaScript interop as, as well as C++ interop. Uh, for C++ interop specifically, uh, no generation of bindings is needed. C and C++ libraries are readily available. For C and C++ libraries that don't have their own dependencies, you can basically drag and drop them into your project. Uh, make headers public. Uh, again, it's all based on convention. And just import them, and you can use them. Uh, more advanced features of C++, like templates, also work. So you can de type def, declare a type def for a template on the C++ side, and that will become available in Swift. Uh, and it works both ways. You can call Swift from C++, if needed, which is great uh, for large code bases uh, that you may have in C and C++ if you want to adopt some high-level language incrementally. If you want to adopt some high-level language with Swift, you can do that incrementally, rewriting like file by file or function by function, mixing and matching these together. Um, and I've also demonstrated to you that uh, we optimize here for binary size with embedded Swift. Uh, we also have control of uh, memory allocations if needed specifically in this project, uh, it, was imp it, it was important for, uh, uh, for audio processing. Now back to slides. To wrap things up, I encourage you to try Swift for WebAssembly, which is now available in preview uh, with, latest development, with latest Swift development snapshots at swift.org slash download. Uh, Swift 6.0 branched off, I think, uh, today. So in a few days, you will see Swift 6.0 development snapshots there. But right now, these are snapshots of the main branch. You can find the package I've just demoed at github.com slash apples slash swift for wasm examples. 
And one other important package to check out is WasmKit, maintained by the Swift Wasm community, uh, which is a WebAssembly runtime, embeddable WebAssembly runtime, uh, implemented in Swift. Uh, it also supports WASI Preview 1, uh, and it has with uh, binding, bindings generation support. It can generate Swift, uh, it, sorry, it can generate WebAssembly interface types from Swift declarations, and can also generate Swift for a given WebAssembly for a given WIT file. Um, and lastly, join the conversation at forums.swift.org. Uh, I will be publishing, uh, I'm working currently on a more formal, formal, uh, formal document within the Swift Evolution Framework, uh, which is a vision for WebAssembly support in Swift, which will formalize our roadmap, uh, things that we will want to prioritize, and of course, Community feedback is wel welcome, and uh, I'll publish that document. Uh, it will be announced on forums.swift.org. I'm also happy to answer your questions here. Thank you. Any questions? Hi. So uh, you, you talk about preview one. You talk about tweet, and uh, there is a roadmap soon, but what about preview two? Uh, <laughs> so, I'm I'm not a maintainer of Wasm Kit uh, at the current moment. I did contribute, uh, but I think I, I I encourage you to open an issue on Wasm Kit, and uh, it will be it it should be on the roadmap. Uh, I do mention uh, the component model in the the draft of the vision document that I have that I'm working on right now. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't provide a specific timeline, but this is, I, I would say that more or less that it, it's in the, with WASI adoption, it would become inevitable for us uh, to adopt WASI Preview 2. I would say concurrency support is uh, important in Swift. Swift has a, I did not have a chance to show Swift concurrency here, but it's much more advanced than what you uh, may have seen in other languages that support for actors, distributed actors, structured concurrency. It's all part of the language, and with Swift 6.0 specifically, you get data, data race safety. So the compiler will tell you you're actually trying to access this value concurrently from different uh, threads, or it's called isolation domain, since uh, you may have concurrency even in a single-threaded environment, like embedded, or uh, by default with embedded uh, Swift for WebAssembly. Um, so there are a lot of like, we know async is coming in WASI preview free. So we can maybe, maybe we can actually take advantage of that and come up with like first class uh, support. It's, it's at least something to consider. It's again, no specific timeline I can provide, unfortunately, but I'm super excited about a WASI, what's it called? 0 0.3 at this point, not WASI preview three, uh, and async in the component model. Uh, I'm also, uh, I've, if you're interested in async and uh, these kind of serverless uh, environments, uh, I'm also working on adding support for uh, WASI uh, to Swift Neo, which is a, a framework for concurrent I.O., networking I.O., uh, which would be great and could be potentially integrated with other, with these serverless runtimes. And I, th I think that would be a great kind of Foundation for WASI Preview Three uh, implementation as well. Uh, that's that's as much of an answer I can give specifically for that. When you use uh, Swift as a guest language, um, how does it compare with the uh, other uh, common uh, uh, guest language or the binary size? Uh, for the binary size? Yeah. Was the binary size, for um, example, to Rust or other? So language. specifically with WASI, I, I can caution you, with the current WASI snapshot or one support, uh, that's the binary size is a big kind of drawback there. Mm -hmm. Well, Swift has an advantage with uh, string processing. The string processing in Swift is Unicode correct. Mm -hmm. That means we have to ship uh -huh. Unicode tables there. So like, for example, you have some complex, it's great for localization and internalization, but that's the trade-off uh, non-embedded Swift makes. Like okay. I've shown you here, what I've shown you here is embedded Swift mode. It strips out, like 
there's no string type there. You, you, you can work on strings as arrays of bytes, mm -hmm. and that gives you like full control. So hello world printer with embedded Swift is, I think, 600 bytes or something okay. on, on that order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. And you can build from there. From that perspective, it's like, you have full control, it's basically a higher level. You can go as, as low as C, and you can build, get all of the first class features. And then you can fully control, like, okay, I don't need Unicode correctness uh, to the same degree. And uh, then you operate on arrays of bytes, and, and that means you, you can stay within embedded Swift constraints, which will give you uh, small binaries. That, that's, these are like the metrics that I can provide for you. I, I've tried, like, Small like micro benchmarks there, mm -hmm. so you can't go as low as like literally 600 bytes. Uh, and with something more advanced, with this project you have seen, there there's a bunch of code there. It's mm -hmm. 100 kilobytes here, yeah. but it has like an allocator, a bunch of C++ uh, code in there as well. It's also auto generated. So I think for your use cases, it would be interesting. Thank you. This is a really cool talk. Um, so for Kotlin, there's a Compose multi-platform. And doing some research, I found a project for Swift UI called Tokamak. Um, do you have any insights in like our web developers trying to build entire applications with Swift UI that they then could compile to WebAssembly and just yeah, have something like Kotlin Compose Multiplatform for Swift? It's uh, hard for me to say. I work on developer tools, first, first of all. Not an expert in UI frameworks, unfortunately. I can't comment on that. I think we're out of time, so thanks again. <laughs>